Has anyone ever told you that Halloween was bad luck? I'm sure you've heard it a hundred times, if not more. I don't know what it is, but there seems to be this stigma about Halloween and bad luck going hand in hand. I didn't used to believe that, but I guess after the horrible night I had, I'm a believer myself. Let me explain. I'm not usually one for blind dates, but after spending the last two years being completely single and unattached, I decided to give it a go. I mean, what's the harm, right? I really love the fall season, so I decided to have this date on Halloween. I guess my logic was that since a lot of people were going to be out trick-or-treating, everything would be pretty much empty. I decided that before I picked my date up, I should probably bring her something. A small gift. I mean, I had seen it done in the movies a hundred times, so what was the harm, right? I stopped at one of the stores and went to get her a box of candy. But since it was Halloween, almost everything was completely sold out. That was my first mistake. Shopping at the last minute. The only thing that I could find was an old heart-shaped box of Valentine's Day candy hidden on one of the shelves behind some stuffed animals. I guess I was pretty desperate, so I grabbed it. I hurried back to my car and went to pick up my date. And this was my second mistake. I had spent so much time at the store looking for a box of candy that I was 10 minutes late. You're never supposed to do that. You're never supposed to ever keep a lady waiting. The date hadn't even started yet and I was already blowing it. I was already feeling like such an idiot when I went to pick her up. After I got her into the car, I thought it would be a good idea to try to compliment her dress. It was actually quite pretty, and she looked very stunning in it. I told her how pretty I thought she looked, but I got no response. Just this cold, vacant stare on her face. I figured since that wasn't working, I should try the candy. I thought I would play it smooth and set it on her lap and just see what her reaction was. I didn't realize that the plastic on the cover had actually been torn, and when I placed it on her lap, the chocolates proceeded to spill everywhere on the floor of the car. I apologized profusely, of course, feeling like an absolute idiot. I figured the best thing I could do at this point was just keep my mouth shut and drive to the restaurant. Which brings me to my third mistake. I didn't make reservations for that night. I figured everything would be empty because it was Halloween and no one would be going out to dinner. But I was mistaken. The first restaurant I stopped at, I went inside first to have a look at how busy it was. And of course the place was packed. I found another nice restaurant just down the road. And again it was the same story. I went inside to gauge the situation and it was packed as well. There were a lot more people out that night than I had anticipated. I must have driven at least another 20 or 30 minutes before I finally stumbled upon a restaurant that didn't look that busy and I figured we could eat at. Unfortunately, it wasn't the fanciest of places, but I was starting to run out of options. When we sat down to eat, everyone kept staring at us. I couldn't really tell at first what they were all looking at, but everyone was giving us these awkward stares. It certainly couldn't be her. I mean, she looked gorgeous. I excused myself to the restroom and gave myself a quick look over in the bathroom mirror, and that was when I noticed it. Not only had I forgotten to tuck my shirt in, but there was also a huge stain on it. I tried washing it off in the sink, but it was no good. The stain was pretty badly set, and I was wearing a white shirt which made it even more obvious. My fly was also open. Talk about embarrassing. I have to confess at this point, I actually don't know how to tie a necktie, so I just wore a clip-on. And yet somehow I managed to wear the darn thing crooked. I tried frantically to at least make it look somewhat straight while adjusting it in the bathroom mirror. And as I was fidgeting with it, the clip on it actually snapped. So now not only did I have a stain on my shirt, I also had a broken tie that I couldn't wear. <sighs> Could this night possibly get any worse? I went back to my date and everyone was still staring. Which brings me to my next mistake. I had been in the bathroom for a very long time and I had kept her waiting again. I tried to apologize to her again, but I could tell I was starting to make a scene because people started shouting at us to leave. A few people got so mad at me they started threatening to call the cops. I had made an absolute fool of myself, and by this point I was just ready to give up. We went back to the car and 
I just drove around with her for a while. She stayed completely silent the whole time. I could tell I had ruined her night. I felt like a complete moron. This was without a doubt the single worst date I've ever been on, and everything that went wrong was my fault. I felt really bad for her, so I decided the best thing I could do at that point was just drop her off and say goodnight. We got back and I made a failed attempt at small talk. It was pretty clear that she just wanted the night to be over. So I dropped her off, closed the door, and that was it. I knew I was never going to see her again, and I'm sure she was fine with that. Now call me crazy for doing this, but since it was still pretty early, I decided I was going to give this another try. But not with her. Someone else. Someone random. I began walking around and making my selection, and I finally settled on one. Jennifer. Nice name. She was around my age, too. Well, only one thing left to do at that point. Start digging. Test one two. Uh, this is James Evitz. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, October eleventh, nineteen ninety two. I'm recording this to document the events of the last eight nights. Uh, I'm so tired, but I need to keep going. I need to keep fighting. I don't know how much more of this I can take with all this sneaking out at night. I, I hate not sleeping, but. As long as those freaking vampires are walking around at night, the city isn't safe. Now, by my count, I've killed over a dozen of those bloodsuckers. I, I do not consider myself a hero. I'm not expecting a medal for this or any of that nonsense. I just got so damn tired of living in fear. Oh, it was so horrifying to watch. The way they blend in. The way they move around at night and gathered together to feed. <sighs> Last night I, I, I got sloppy. I made a mistake by trying to fight too many of them at once and one of them even bit me. Thank God I, I haven't turned yet. I've been cleaning the wound non-stop and it, it, it seems like it's helping but I... look, if I do turn, I want you to know what happened. So if you find this tape among my possessions, you'll know the truth. You'll know that I slayed as many of them as I could and that yes, vampires are real. Uh, not, not fiction, not, not Hollywood. They're real. And I, I hope to God that if I have turned by the time you're hearing this that, that well, you'll ram a stake right through my heart and just, please just make sure to tell my family that I... Just a moment. Uh, come in. Good morning, Ethan. Oh, good morning, Doctor. I have your pills and your breakfast. Don't forget that we have a 10 o'clock session. I'd like to speak to James again. Tell me, Ethan, is James here right now with us? No, Doctor. Uh, he was, but he left. Maybe he'll be in the session with us if he's ready to talk. Doctor, can I watch TV now? Okay, just for a few minutes. I'll be back. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, so. Uh, no, I think more about jail code. And police are now calling the recent string of murders of 15 homeless men and women the act of a serial killer. So far, there are no leads, and the motive for the murders is not- Oh, James. What did you do?
Being a cop was always my dream from very early on. This will sound cliche, but I honestly feel that it has been my calling in life to serve and protect others, even if that means crossing a line. The first day my uniform arrived and I put it on, I felt like I was donning armor. I felt like a gladiator or a superhero even. I felt powerful. And I felt just. I was no longer a man. I was a symbol for good. I knew I was going to do great things and I was going to make the world a better place. And I was going to start right here in this city. The nights are the hardest. That's when the city is at its worst. All the gutter trash start crawling out of their holes after the sun goes down. You can practically see the street corners decaying as the usual riffraff start making the rounds with their narcotics, prostitution, and gang activity. My first week wasn't perfect by any stretch. It could have gone a lot smoother, but as a rookie, nothing ever goes to plan. I knew this going in. It was a Saturday night, just before midnight. I had been keeping an eye on a low-level hood rat named Jerome that had been dealing methamphetamine to high schoolers. A little tidbit of information I gathered from a street bum for a pack of smokes and a case of malt liquor. I knew he was just a dealer and not the supplier. Taking him down would be like cutting the head off a dandelion. If I was going to do this, I needed to dig out the roots. I kept a close watch on him from my car. I saw him stumble out of the strip club looking disheveled as hell and about two whiskey sours away from alcohol poisoning. There was a girl with him. I assumed from the way she was dressed that she was less likely his girlfriend and more likely one of the dancers from the club. I overheard him call her Jasmine. Probably wasn't her real name, but that was all I needed to build my ruse. I phoned the strip club and asked for her. The bartender told me that she had just left with a friend and that she'd be back to work Monday night. Girls like this are always side hustling looking for a way to become famous, a chance to leave behind the lap dances and oily $1 bills. I knew I could use this to my advantage. I said I was sorry for calling so late and identified myself as a scout for a modeling agency. I said I had just received a late night urgent email from a cosmetics company looking for models for a photo shoot on Monday morning and that this was a one-time offer. I told him Jasmine had only left us her work number to contact her and since she wasn't there, I would have to contact someone else. I had barely blinked and the bartender came running to the door, shouting for Jasmine to come inside and take the call. She scurried inside, leaving Jerome dumbfounded and alone, exactly as I needed him to be. I made my move and hurried across the street. I got within two feet of Jerome, glanced left and right at the vacant boardwalk, quickly applied a chokehold around his neck, and dragged him into the dark alley. I slammed him against the side of the building and delivered a hard gut shot to his liver, causing him to puke a mixture of booze and blood onto the pavement. A name, I demanded. <coughs> Jerome! Jerome! He said as he gasped desperately for air. No, I said as I kicked the toe of my boot into his face. I want your supplier's name. He spit a mouthful of blood and a couple of teeth onto my boots before reaching into his jacket and drawing a small pistol. His mistake was telegraphing the move. I grabbed the firearm with both hands and wrenched it backwards with his index fingers still inside the trigger guard, snapping the bone in the process. A few smacks to his head with his pistol and he was all loosened up and ready to talk. He gave me the name of the supplier, Jeffrey Rames. He then asked me if I was going to arrest him. I said no. He then asked if he was free to go. I said no. He said he thought we had an understanding. I said no. He wasn't carrying any contraband on him, but he did have around 10 grand in cash, which I took. This did not amuse him. He asked me if I was a crooked cop. This did not amuse me. I crushed his windpipe with an elbow to the throat and threw him into one of the dumpsters. Baseless accusations like that are bound to get you killed. The nerve of some people. That ten grand from his pocket found its way to a children's hospital the next morning. Compliments of yours truly. I took one night off of work to reflect on my actions. I concluded that I had done the right thing. I then spent the next two weeks tracking Jeffrey Rames' activities. 
he had been running his entire operation inside the most unlikely of places. From the outside, it looked like any other mom and pop store with the exception of the attached food storage warehouse. It was way too large for such a small storefront, and to me, it stood out like a linebacker at a ballet recital. Appearances aside, the setup was fairly well camouflaged. The storefront itself was at least partially legit, with actual employees and regular customers favoring scratch-off tickets and beef jerky over heroin. The dealers played it nonchalant, picking up cans of dog food in abnormally high amounts and putting them in the trunks of expensive European sports cars. No one with that kind of cash doesn't spoil their pet with gourmet meals over such cheap canned dog food. Between their flaunted high-end spending habits and never once seeing even a single strand of dog hair on their clothing, I knew that these were the guys to rough up. I tailed one of the drivers leaving the store to a parking garage in a seedy area, the kind where hobos and carjackers were more plentiful than the beer bottles lining the gutter. His Lamborghini couldn't have looked more out of place. I pulled up alongside his vehicle and wasted no time telling him I had a few questions. I drew my sidearm and he folded like a cheap lawn chair at a discount store, opening the trunk and exposing the contents. 40 cans of dog food, and a loaded handgun with the serial number filed off. Somehow I doubt you have a permit for that weapon, or even a dog for that matter, I said, grabbing the bag of dog food cans and putting them inside my trunk. I walked back to the perp and worked him over a bit. I only had to hit him twice and he gave me an address. Maybe cracking his skull was an overstep, but pain is a great interrogation tool. Keeps people honest. I didn't have time for him to try and give me the runaround, and I wasn't going to risk being ambushed. He was now going to be a tidy insurance package for me. I made him get inside my car and drove him to the address he gave me, the canning factory where the dog food was packaged. I handcuffed him to the seat before grabbing my rifle from the trunk and making my way to the overhead doors in the loading bay. From the outside, it looked like the real article a small canning operation for a cheap off-brand of dog food. But a quick peek inside the windows told me it was just another front. Workers packing bags of narcotics into cans of dog food on a packaging line before boxing them up at the other end and loading them onto trucks. Slick as grease and twice as filthy. I returned to grab my guest from the car and took him inside, the barrel of my rifle coaxing him forward. I guess seeing me there with a gun to this fool's brainstem didn't sit well with the workers. I needed to know if they were aware of what they were doing, or if they were simply somehow caught in the middle through coercion. A quick glance over the lot of them, and the telltale printing of firearms beneath their white coats had just answered my question. I saw only one of them go for a gun, and that was all I needed to justify what happened next. I sent a rifle round through his skull and watched his brain meat spray all over the packaging line. I wasn't screwing around. The air inside was now so tense that so much as a muscle twitch under the eye of any one of them, and I would have emptied the magazine into their face. I made one of the workers use the phone inside the factory to call his boss, Jeffrey Rames, and tell him that a health inspector was inside the factory and would be shutting the place down for various health code violations. I then made him hand the phone over to me and told Mr. Rames that I would need to speak with him first thing tomorrow morning. And wouldn't you know it, the address he gave me was the address of the grocery store. It had all come full circle. I hung up the phone and prepared for a long night. I made the workers clear the narcotic loaded cans from the line and start fresh with clean ones. One by one. I executed the workers and tossed them into the food grinder, while the remaining ones packaged the cans that came off the end of the line, minus the drugs of course. I then had them load up the packaged cans into one of the trucks. I kept this going until only one worker and the drug dealer remained. I made them play rock, paper, scissors to decide who got to live and who got canned. The relief on the worker's face as he got scissors and the dealer got paper was almost endearing. At least, until I mentioned that I was playing as well, and that rifle beats everything. My head pounded with their pathetic screams of, please just arrest me, and what kind of cop are you? Maybe their pleas made me bitter? Maybe that's why I chose not to shoot them, 
and force them into the grinder instead. I may have had to package those last few cans myself, but I'm not bitter about that part of it. I grabbed one of the white workers' coats from the locker room before getting inside the loaded truck and driving it to my destination. I dropped a pallet of cans off at the busiest animal shelter in the city. I knew that they would appreciate the generosity and perhaps the change in the dog food recipe. I then drove the truck back to the factory and parked it inside before setting the whole place on fire. An anonymous call from a payphone to emergency services and another loose end was neatly tied off. They'd be busy putting out that fire for a while. It was now morning and I had an appointment to keep. I got into my car and headed to the grocery store to meet with Rames. I arrived at the store before they opened and took the package of cans I confiscated from the dealer from the trunk of my car. I still had the white factory coat on. I hoped it was good enough to help me get closer to Rames. I knocked on the door and was greeted by an elderly clerk who let me inside after I identified myself as a health inspector. I told him that I was there about a package recall and showed him the cans inside the bag. He didn't even flinch. I gathered from his body language that he didn't know what was hidden inside them. He wasn't a part of this. I needed to let him go. He directed me to the attached warehouse and said that the other workers hadn't arrived yet. I told him he needed to keep the store closed for the day and to go home while I did my inspection. He promptly left through the side exit. I locked the door behind him and headed inside the warehouse. From the small foreman's office, I could hear laughter and smell cigar smoke. It seemed like someone was enjoying a rolled Cuban and an episode of Friends. I walked in and introduced myself to the heavyset man sitting on the extravagant leather chair. You must be Mr. Rames. We spoke on the phone last night. Are you the only one here? Yes, I am. I didn't catch your name. He said as he extended his hand to shake mine. I then opened the white factory coat just enough that he could see my badge. He turned off the television set. As his face went ghost white, he let out a sigh and then asked, How much? How much to make you disappear? I said I wasn't for sale. He then pulled several stacks of hundred dollar bills from his coat and lined them up on the desk like keys on a piano. I drew my revolver. He stacked two more onto the desk as I cocked back the hammer. He was starting to sweat. I can't go to prison, he cried. I'm not arresting you, I said as I put the barrow below his chin. Every cop has a price, he screamed. Every cop can be made dirty. I laughed and said, you know, you guys keep saying that. It's true, he shouted. You, you can all be bought and sold. I shook my head. No, not that part. The part where you all keep assuming I'm a cop. You know, I've always wanted to be one. That was a real mess. Point blank with the 357 always is. I couldn't get his blood out of my uniform. Good thing I ordered two more from the costume store. You know, being a cop was always my dream from very early on. This will sound cliche, but I honestly feel that it has been my calling in life to serve and protect others. Even if that means crossing a line. Looks like you found my tape. That's good. You're smart. I don't know who you are, but I'm pretty sure I can trust you. I'm sorry for making you run in circles like this, but I had to be certain you weren't one of them. They've been following me everywhere in those white vans with the weird logos. I think they're trying to kill me. I'll leave you another tape at the GPS coordinates on the back of this recorder. I'll explain more. close. I was nearly spotted a moment ago. One of those vans parked right outside the coffee shop I was in. I ran out the back just as those men were entering. 
I'm recording this in the old furniture factory. It's been a makeshift home for me these past few weeks. Guess you could call it my hideout. Listen, I'll cut right to the chase. You want to know about the signal, right? Two words. Mind control. It's really that simple. I'm sorry to cut this short. I left a flash drive with coordinates for where I'll leave the next tape inside that coffee shop, underneath the men's room sink. There are 16 files. The first 15 are viruses, just in case someone else finds it first, so don't open them. The GPS coordinates are in the 16th file. Go. Find my next tape. Godspeed. I first picked up the signal when I was watching a television program in my room. There was a faint flicker on the screen, followed by a distinct hum that only lasted for a few moments. I thought maybe it was just bad reception, so I looked outside the window to see if anything was blocking the dish. But the dish wasn't there. Instead, there was a small metallic sphere in its place. I could see it oscillating. Every few seconds, There would be a high-pitched squeak coming from it, like nails on a chalkboard. I was just about to shut the window when I saw a man a few floors up jump to his death. Naturally, they ruled it a suicide, but I was skeptical. I left that night and made my way around the city. I started making a map of all the areas with a recent spike in suicides, violence, and crime. And every single location had one thing in common. There was always one of those metallic oscillating spheres nearby. I had never noticed them before. They were always on locations up high, and usually where you'd place a receiver or satellite dish. Except these weren't there for receiving signals. They appeared to be transmitting. I'll leave you another tape in a few days. I'll leave a cipher in the want ads of the local newspaper. Follow the clues. It'll lead you to my next tape. It was awful. I just saw two homeless men fighting outside. One ripped the other's face clean off like it was a band-aid. I looked up and saw one of those spheres again. I threw a rock at it and managed to break it. As soon as I did, the one homeless man got off of the other and walked away like nothing had happened. Like I said, this is about mind control, an experiment in violence. It seems like not everyone is affected the same way by the signal. Some commit murder. Some commit robbery. Some kill themselves. If you've made it this far, it means that you and I have been unaffected by the frequency. Don't ask me why. I honestly don't know. Maybe it's selective. I've been seeing those white vans again. They're closing in on me. You need to be careful. I'll leave my next tape at my hideout. Make sure you're not followed. I managed to triangulate the locations of all those spheres. When I mapped them out, they formed a sigil. I had to dig through at least 50 books to figure out what it meant. It's a symbol for chaos, disorder, terror. It all points to an abandoned radio tower. If I'm correct, that's where the signal is really coming from. Those spheres are just acting like receivers and not transmitters like I had originally thought. You need to get out of here. I think my hideout was compromised. Head to the tower and don't get spotted by the men in those vans. I'll leave another tape there somewhere. Please, find it. listening to this, it means you made it. Here's my progress so far. I managed to break another 30 of those spheres before I came up here to the tower. It's strange. I checked the pieces of a few of them, and there was nothing inside. No electronics. No moving parts. Just a shell. There also doesn't seem to be any power running to this tower. Even the backup generators are down doesn't make any sense. 
Everything pointed to this location. I don't get it. Where is the signal really coming from? Could it be? Is it possible it's coming from? Oh no. They're here. I'm just gonna hide the recorder. What are you doing here? Please, you need to come back with us. I'm not going anywhere. You're off your meds again. You need to come back to your room at the hospital. I'm not crazy. You're having an episode. Let us help you. Don't come any closer. Let go of me. Sedate him. Take him back to the hospital. I'll write back with the officer. Thank you for your assistance, officer. I'm glad no one was hurt. Doctor? What was he doing up here? He's prone to psychotic episodes. Nothing more. He managed to sneak out of the hospital a few weeks ago. Without his pills, he has a hard time distinguishing reality from fantasy. That's it, huh? What a whack job. Crazy talk about aliens and mind control. Crazy guy, right? Officer. He never mentioned anything like that. You're right. You know I always do that. What are you doing? Have you ever loved someone so much that there isn't anything in the world that you wouldn't do for them? That always sounded so cliche to me. Just a nice sentiment that people say to one another but never really mean. Anyone that's ever been in a relationship certainly wants to feel that way for the other person. But how often is that ever really sincere? I'd say it's extremely rare. Just ask anyone who's ever been dumped by their significant other. Love is fleeting. It has conditions. It's like a two-way street littered with hazard signs on both sides, no end in sight to the roadwork. I loved my wife. That's the past tense, I know. You see, she passed away four years ago. An undiagnosed illness robbed me of her. Robbed us both of her. Our son was less than a year old at the time. One moment she's tickling his stomach as he's cradled in her arms on the couch. The next she's on the floor, completely unresponsive her body cushioning his fall as she collapsed. Losing her, I felt like half a person. It took that tragedy for me to realize that I didn't do enough with the time we had. I didn't love strongly enough. I did nothing to prove my devotion to her, and now I'd never get the chance. For the first year after her passing, I was like a ghost. I felt completely disconnected. Even as I held our son, I felt like only half of my heart could love. The other half was in a deep slumber. I mourned her loss with every waking moment. Her death was consuming me and I was allowing it to. I needed to wake up. It was a Saturday morning. Our son was turning five. We had just moved house a few weeks earlier and we were still getting used to the neighborhood. The move was meant to be a fresh start for both of us. New scenery new people, a new life together. The house wasn't perfect. The front screen door was loose and would constantly bang in a strong breeze, and I had already been locked inside my bedroom on two occasions due to the lock sticking. But still, it was home. My son was in the living room. There was some cartoon playing on the TV screen, but he wasn't paying attention. I had just finished making us some pancakes for breakfast and thought it might be nice for us to eat together on the couch. When I walked in with the food, he was facing away from me and fidgeting with something in his hands. I thought maybe he was playing with one of his action figures, so I set the plates down on the coffee table and asked if he wanted me to play with him. When he turned in my direction, I saw what he was holding. It was a photo of the three of us, my wife, him, and myself, taken when he was just six months old. It was the first time I had ever seen him do this. 
and it was the first time I saw in his eyes the exact same thing everyone else had seen in my own after his mother had died. I wrapped my arms around him tightly and let the grief of the past four years wash away in a stream of tears. In that moment, things began to click back into place inside my head. I knew that I would do anything for him. I felt repurposed. I felt reborn. I felt complete again. And I smiled. This revelation was reanimating. I ran upstairs to grab his birthday present and hurried back down to the living room. I tossed it into his lap and watched him marvel at the shiny wrapping and bright yellow bow. He wasted no time as he excitedly unwrapped the box and pulled the plush teddy bear from its cardboard prison. Instantly, he loved it. He loved me. And I loved him. After breakfast, I went into the kitchen to wash the dishes. This was usually a chore we shared, but I decided to give him a break since it was his birthday. I had barely gotten my hands into the hot sink when I heard footsteps on the hallway stairs, followed by the sound of the front door violently slamming. Thinking it was just the wind catching the screen door, I continued with the dishes. It was perhaps five minutes later that I had finished up and walked into the living room to check on my son. And as my eyes surveyed the completely unoccupied room, I could feel my heart sink into my stomach. I ran outside calling my son's name over and over again, my voice echoing ominously through the cul-de-sac. I was completely gripped by the overwhelming panic now filling my body as it became clear that my son was missing. I phoned the police. They issued an Amber Alert and I was told to wait, but that was not going to happen. With each passing minute, I found a new way to blame myself. How could I have let this happen? Why didn't I check the door? Why did I allow myself to assume anything? I found myself pacing the cul-de-sac for hours, desperate for any sign of my son. It was getting dark. I went back to the house and grabbed a flashlight from the garage. I had combed the street so many times at this point that I could practically count the bricks on the foundation of every house in the area. This was when I decided to focus my attention to the dense woods behind our house. I made the trek into the woods, my shoes leaving a heavy trail in the mud as I wandered in random directions, looking for my little boy. I don't know how much time passed, but I had been out there long enough for the mud on my sneakers to harden into clay and for my flashlight to grow dim as the battery drained. I was lost. I stared up at the autumn sky as if I were begging the universe to piece together an unsolvable puzzle, to point me in the right direction. I didn't have to wait long. The scent of burning cedars and the distinct glow of a campfire had shifted my focus. I made my way toward the crackling fire, which was dead center in a small clearing within the maze of rotting trees. My eyes absorbed the illuminated image of an overweight bearded man, wearing overalls, sitting on a decaying log in front of the fire. He was barefoot, his feet and legs covered in mud and filth. He was like a statue sitting there, his unflinching gaze fixated on the flames. Excuse me, I asked. I'm a bit lost. Can you help me? He remained silent. If it weren't for his extremely labored breathing, I could have easily mistaken him for a statue. I called to him again. Excuse me, do you have a phone? Again, no response, but his eyes did shift up slightly in my direction. This seemed to be going nowhere. I knew he wasn't going to help me. I just didn't know why he wasn't making the effort. I wanted to walk away but something at his feet had just earned my undivided attention. It was muddy, but familiar. A teddy bear. I felt my skin crawl and a knot twist deep inside the pit of my stomach as I noticed the dried blood on his hands. Where did you get that teddy bear? I demanded. He didn't reply. He simply lowered his head and began to shake it violently left and right. Where is my son? I shouted. 
This question made him stand erect, his enormous size seeming to double as he stood upright and dug his fingers into his chubby face. He continued to erratically shake his head from side to side, all the while making the most inhuman screeches I've ever heard. Where is my son? I demanded again, my hands now clenched into fists. My adrenaline was pumping now. I could hear the tinnitus ring in my ears as my vision began to tunnel. I looked at the burning logs, and that was when I noticed the bones. I snapped. Something dark entered my mind. I was no longer in control. I shoved my hand inside the fire and pulled out the first burning log that my palm came into contact with. I swung it like a baseball bat, connecting with the side of his head. The impact was so hard and so strong that the log broke in half. He collapsed, the muddy ground doing very little to break his fall. I could see the contents of his skull spill out onto the dead leaves that littered the forest floor. Was I vindicated? Was my son? I wasn't really sure. I managed to find my way back home. I went through the back door and left my muddy shoes outside on the back steps. I climbed the stairs to the upstairs bathroom and took a shower. I cried the entire time. As I said, I loved my son. In my own logic, I had just proved that I would do anything in the world for him. As I sat there and bandaged up my burnt hands, I reflected on the tragic events of the day. Once again, I felt the emptiness of loss consuming me. I grabbed the cordless phone and began dialing the police. I still didn't know how I was going to explain what had happened, but I was positive that there was enough evidence inside those woods to piece everything together. As I dialed, I made my way to the bedroom to get some clean clothing. The door was locked again. Like I said, we had been having problems with it. Imagine my shock when my son opened the door. His new teddy bear cradled lovingly in his arms. You see, that morning as I was washing the dishes, he had gone upstairs and taken a nap in my bed. The door got stuck again and after he woke up, he waited patiently for me to come upstairs and let him out. As for the front door, it was windy again that morning, and the screen door had simply slammed in the breeze, as it had done countless times before. The local news report the next morning filled in the rest of the gaps, talking at length about the murder that had taken place inside those woods, the senseless killing of a mute male that was also mentally disabled, the one that took a teddy bear everywhere he went. As for the blood on his clothes and the bones in the fire, I learned that he would burn the diseased animal carcasses from his family's farm so that the other animals wouldn't become infected a chore he undertook to help his father. I forgot to bring my muddy shoes in from the back door step. I went to get them a little while ago and they were gone. Someone left me a note on a piece of crumpled up paper covered in muddy fingerprints. It was only four words, but it was very specific. It read, I followed your footprints. I know his father loved him. I know there is nothing in the world that he wouldn't have done for his son. Maybe that even includes murder. If so, I guess that what he's about to do will just about make us even. Okay, I think it's on. Today is April 9th. My name is Vincent Bardo. I'm 34 years old, divorced, no children. I work as an architect for a large company. I've only recently started working again after a mental breakdown I suffered due to stress. Too many long hours at work under extremely tight timetables, coupled with my furious dedication to the job. Before the breakdown, I hadn't even taken so much as a sick day. I do have siblings, a twin brother named Alex and an older sister named Angela. I haven't seen them since our parents' funeral. If something happens to me, I need to know that they'll be safe. Let me just get into this. 
I probably should have started documenting this earlier, but nothing can be done about that now. There's a serial killer stalking me. He shows me his crimes, his murders. He films them. He's been leaving me videotapes at my house of his sick acts. The first tape showed up a few weeks ago. An old VHS tape with nothing written on it. Just a blank manufacturer's sticker from some company from Pasadena called Timecode that went out of business sometime in the early 2000s. I know because I went through hell trying to locate them. Maybe this monster was someone connected to that company? A former employee, perhaps? I don't know. The first tape was left inside my sun porch sometime in the middle of the night. At least that's what I'm assuming. It hadn't been there when I went to bed, which was pretty late. I locked the porch door at night, so I'm not sure how anyone would have gotten inside. The windows, perhaps? I don't know. Seems unlikely. They've been painted shut for as long as I've lived here. I didn't know what to make of it at first. The tape, I mean. It was just sitting there on the floorboards. Upon examining it, it looked like it had been dropped a few times. The edges were pretty roughed up, and there were also abrasions on the sides. Like it had been used many times inside a camcorder. The sticker read two hours runtime standard play, but the tape amount on the spool was quite slim. I was curious. I went up to the attic and brought down my VHS player. I hadn't used it in over a decade, but fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, it still worked when I plugged it in and played the tape. The video ran for the first several minutes with only darkness and grain. At least that's how it appeared. It was too dark to see anything, but... I could hear something faint inside the static. It sounded like crying. The tape ran for another 15 minutes before stopping. I thought perhaps the VCR malfunctioned, so I hit the play button again, only for it to stop immediately. I ejected the tape and saw that it had indeed reached the end of what was on the spool, far less than the two hour runtime listed on the sticker. I had to get to work, so I left the tape sitting on the TV cabinet and headed to my job. The whole shift, I was in a complete daze as I pondered the footage I had just watched. When I got back home, I headed straight to bed, and planned to watch the tape again the following morning before work. However, when I got up and went to my living room, the tape was gone. I thought maybe I might have misplaced it, but I clearly remembered leaving it on top of the TV cabinet. I went to work that morning feeling horribly perplexed not just about the tape's contents and the crying that I may or may not have been hearing on it, but also its strange appearance inside my porch and its mysterious vanishing act from my TV cabinet. When I got home from work, I went to the front door to check my mailbox before unlocking the door and heading inside with a handful of bills. I locked the door behind me, turned and darn near tripped as my heel caught the corner of a VHS tape laying in my sun porch. I assumed that this was the same tape from the previous day and that I had perhaps put it back in the sun porch without even thinking. I took it to the living room to inspect the case under better light. I had cracked the corner of it when I stepped on it and thought that I may have ruined it. I put it into the VCR and rewound it to the beginning. I wanted to see if it would still play. I turned up the volume on the TV as loud as it would go. I wanted to get a better listen to the crying that I had heard on the tape. I began to fast forward past the dark part in the beginning, until something on the tape caught my attention. There was a brief stutter in the footage, followed by something that was not on the tape when I played it the first time. The image I was seeing was dark and distorted, but noticeable. I had to turn the volume down due to all the screaming coming from the video. There appeared to be someone restrained to a chair most likely a female due to the high-pitched screeches, but the footage was too muddy to see her face. There was someone standing in front of her with something that looked like a hacksaw. Whoever it was appeared to be cutting off her fingers. This only lasted a few moments before the footage abruptly distorted again and went black. I was horrified. I ejected the tape and set it on top of my coffee table. What in God's name had I just watched? I was in a cold sweat and I felt sick to my stomach. I went to take a cold shower to rinse off the sweat before putting on clean clothes and grabbing my phone. I knew I needed to call the police. 
I knew that it was possible that I had just watched a murder happening, and I was now in possession of the evidence. I had just started dialing my cell phone when I noticed that the tape was not sitting on the coffee table where I had left it. Had someone taken it? I checked the front door and it was still locked. Same with the back door. I became nervous that someone might be inside my house, so I did a room by room check. I didn't find anyone, nor the tape for that matter. I was baffled. I had a rough sleep that night. I kept having nightmares about the woman in the footage. Who was she? Was she still alive? Was she dead? Was it real? Was someone just playing a twisted joke on me? There was another tape waiting for me inside the sun porch the following morning. Again, the front and back door were locked. There was a note attached to the tape. It read, You should see yourself. The tape label read two hour runtime standard play. I called in sick to work. I played the tape and its contents scared me more than the footage of the woman from the day before. The tape started with the same black graininess before jumping to a 45 minute shot of me sleeping. Someone had been inside my house. Grabbing my phone, I hadn't even started dialing 911 when the footage jumped again. This time, it was a shot of my hallway closet door. In the footage, it was open, but as I glanced down the hallway, I could see that it was shut. I hadn't opened the closet door in several days. I wondered why I was being shown this. I went over to the closet and opened the door cautiously, fearing that there may have been someone hiding inside. I wish that had been the case. I saw a small white purse laying on its side on the floor of the closet. It looked to be very expensive, the kind only a handful of people could possibly afford. When I picked it up to take a closer look, a severed finger adorned in candy apple red nail polish and a gold wedding band rolled out of one of the pockets and landed on the closet floor. I jumped backwards and screamed, dropping the purse in the process. I'm not a forensics expert, but the finger looked to have been severed recently. I now had another piece of evidence inside my house of this maniac's deeds. I went back to the living room to get the tape from the VCR, but it was gone. The only thing that was still inside the house was the purse and the finger, and I had just unwittingly left my fingerprints all over the evidence. I didn't want to contaminate the scene further, so I put the purse and finger inside a plastic bag inside my freezer. My house was fast becoming a crime scene. I was too afraid to call the police now. What would I have told them? A tape of a possible murder showed up at my house and then it just vanished? The killer left evidence that has my fingerprints on it? There's no way they'd have believed I wasn't involved. The next few weeks the cycle continued. More tapes appearing in my porch that went missing after I watched them. More victims appearing in the videos. More body parts and personal items showing up inside my home. More footage of me sleeping. More cryptic notes attached to the tapes. My freezer was now full of fingers, hands, and feet. Not to mention extravagant wallets, purses, and jewelry. I had to throw all the food out just to make room for it. I began clipping newspaper articles of every missing person that seemed to match the killer's M.O., as well as the items he left me. I needed to find a pattern. There had to be something I was overlooking. The victims looked to have all been financially well off based on their personal effects, and the amount of wedding rings left here led me to believe they were all married. I noticed that some of the tapes had sections of abrupt static where the images would disappear for a few brief moments before resuming, usually right before the camera angle shifted to something else. This didn't appear to be the cameraman starting and stopping the camera. These changes in the footage were more jarring than that. It was like something was missing. Something was being removed. Just to be certain, I ran a head cleaner through the VCR to see if it improved anything. It didn't. The footage in those sections remained just as they had appeared before, with those opaque jumps and static saturated segments. 
as luck or perhaps fate would have it, one of the tapes got stuck inside the machine. I quickly unplugged the box and removed the cover to extract it, using great care not to damage it. This was when I noticed something shiny and sticky on the reel. It was clear adhesive tape. I began to slowly rotate the spool and observed multiple sections like this on the tape. The killer had been using a crude method of editing the footage by cutting out sections of the reel and taping the ends together. This would explain why the running time on each tape was off. But why would he do this? What didn't he want me seeing? Where was the missing footage? I noticed something else after the tape got stuck. I had scraped my thumb on the plastic as I was removing it from the VCR. There was a jagged corner on the case, a crack in the plastic, the same exact crack that the second tape had after I accidentally stepped on it. You see, I hadn't been receiving multiple tapes. I had been watching the same tape over and over again, with the footage inside being cut and spliced into different segments in seemingly random order. Why was he doing this? Was he toying with me? Was this a game? Why me? I haven't been to work in weeks. I have taken an extended leave of absence for the time being. I spent the entire morning setting up a motion-activated surveillance system to monitor the property. I'm going to sleep. Okay. It's just after 1 a.m. I don't know why, but I woke up a few minutes ago in a panic. I felt like someone was standing over me. I went to check the cameras, and they hadn't been trimmed. I checked both the front and back door, and they're still locked. But someone has definitely been here. There's a tape on my nightstand with another note stuck to it. Same message as before. You should see yourself. I'm gonna watch it now. I'll continue this recording after I see what's on this tape. Oh my god. It was me. For the first time, the killer showed his face to the camera. And it was my face. I murdered those people. I... I can't remember doing it, though. It must be from the breakdown I suffered. I, I... I must be having blackouts. It makes sense now. The locks on the doors never being disturbed. The lack of any footage on the surveillance DVR system. The notes on the tape saying you should see yourself. They were me writing to myself to stop the killing. I must have been setting up a camera at night and filming myself sleeping all those nights. I, I had to have been editing out every view of my face each time I tortured and murdered those people. I've been leaving myself clues this whole time. Some part of me must have felt guilty enough to finally leave an image of myself intact on this tape. I'm, I'm sure if I looked hard enough I'd find the camera and the rest of the missing footage. I, I'm a monster, and I guess this tape is now a confession. Uh, therefore, I, I confess. The evidence is in my freezer and on the tape inside the VCR. This will also serve as my last will and testament. I... Uh, I... I leave all my possessions and assets to my siblings, please. Make sure the families of the victims know how sincerely sorry I am. I... Forgive me. I forgive you. It's not your fault mom and dad spoiled you and Angela like they did. It's not your fault you were successful and applied yourself. It's not even your fault that those people are dead. Happy, married, successful, entitled, and pampered snobs that they were. 
But it is your fault that you left your spare key in the most obvious of places. It is your fault you never noticed the food disappearing from the fridge. It is your fault you never once thought to check the basement. And it is your fault you never once picked up a telephone and checked in on your dear twin brother after all this time. But thank you for keeping those body parts and personal belongings in the freezer. Having your fingerprints on them and preserving them like that makes this so much easier. Just gonna borrow your tape recorder here and edit this part out. And don't worry about leaving anything for our sister. She was in the first video.